Good evening. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, I'm Leslie Edwards. I'm the head archivist here at Cranbrook Archives and the Center for Collections and Research. This is the second of our fall lecture series. Um, this one is Scandal, Scalawags, and Unsavory Stories, I'm focused on these individuals at Michigan State, so it should be an interesting, especially for any of you who went there. Or, um, this uh, series came out of uh, an exhibition that uh, we came up with in the archives on letterhead. And after the um, presentation, you're welcome to go down the hall and view the exhibition. And I'll be down there, and we have gallery guides if you'd like to take them with you as well. All right, let me see if I can switch these now. I'm going to give a little introduction first to how Cranbrook relates to scandals and scallywags and unsavory stories. Because, of course, we don't have any of those here in our over 100-year-old history. Um, all right. Oops. Okay, so we start off with uh, the usual shenanigans of Cranbrook School boys. You can see here that um, one of the local boys who lived up on Brady Lane and his brother were driving on the football field in the middle of the night and refused to stop even after being challenged by the public safety people and, until a watchman fired a shot in the air. Lots of pranks occurred at schools, of course, both in the boys' school and the girls' school, Kingswood School. Um, you can see on the left a prank um, by the boys of Cranbrook School in, in filling the, audit, uh, the gymnasium with the smell of skunk. The article went on to talk about how this is not proper behavior and they better not do this and they should feel shame for having having caused this prank. And then on the right, student behavior disgraces school. This is Kingswood School for Girls. Um, they didn't, weren't quite so rowdy as the boys, but they did apparently not care about their reputations in 1949 and were carousing with the boys off campus. Theft. We have had a few thefts at Cranbrook, um, sad but true. This is a big campus and it has grown over the years to 319 acres. Um, from small things on the left, you can see some stealing that was going on in the school buildings. To on the right, a former uh, employee of Cranbrook who actually stole a painting. You can see the painting behind him. It's a Rembrandt Peel painting of George Washington. It was recovered and it is part of our collection. Um, he was uh, sent to jail and did confess to stealing. I think the photograph's kind of amusing because he's posing in front of the painting that he stole. Now another theft that occurred was at the boathouse, which was on Kings, is, well still is on Kingswood Lake. Um, there was a sculpture of Mercury that sat upon a pillar you can see on the left in the photograph. And in 1953, apparently it was the first one was stolen. So in 1953, a replica was purchased and donated by, you can see, uh, Mrs. Bradfield. She was, um, Elizabeth Palmer Bradfield was of the Palmer and Ward families in Pontiac. She donated the second copy, which was then torn off the pillar and thrown in Kingswood Lake. Now, no one knew it was thrown in the lake until many years later when some kids saw an arm sticking out of the ice. And the following summer, the sculpture was recovered by uh, scuba divers from Northville and um, restored, and it's now in Cranbrook House on display. This is a great story. This is the Chiquita banana story. This is two girls from Kingswood who decided to just play a joke and they put the stickers from the Chiquita bananas, you know, all of us as kids, we played with those stickers. They put them on their forehead. And some other girls in school said, what are you doing with the, the stickers? And they said, well, we're collecting them. 
well, why are you collecting them? And they told, you know, a little white lie and said, we're collecting them because we're raising money to buy a car or to get a car. If we get 1,565 stickers, Chiquita Banana's going to give us a car and we're going to and we're gonna sell it for the scholarship fund. They had no idea what was gonna happen because everybody believed them. So all of a sudden, people all over from the school, all over the place, even all over the country, started sending them stickers. And they got so many stickers. Well, what also happened was that the headmistress at the time, she didn't know anything about it, and she was fuming mad that these girls did this without talking to her because what ended up resulting in this was the head of the company came, collected the stickers, it became this huge publicity event, and he actually, they actually did raise the money for a scholarship fund and brought um, a student here from, um, the first one was from El Salvador, I think. So because this was relating to letterhead, here's the letterhead from the United Fruit Company. There was a scholarship for at least two years in 1965 and 66. So two different students came to Kingswood School. And to use an old cliche, never underestimate the power of a woman and especially a Kingswood girl. So this was a prank that turned out really well. Now, in 1970, there was a crisis at Cranbrook. This was at the Academy of Art. And what happened was in the winter, the Academy was having some internal troubles and, and trying to decide how they were gonna resolve the troubles and also sort of reorganize um, within uh, the, the departments. So some of the, the way it worked is they had faculty contracts and they, they did not renew a couple of the contracts. Well, the artists and residents that um, were the recipients of this non-renewal, of course, became incensed and felt that they had been fired, which in essence, they weren't fired, but it still felt that way. So they organized supporters, they told the public that they were indispensable to the academy and that they had been unjustly fired. And they, it even got to uh, a Detroit news critic who wrote up all this press about it. Um, so there was this big student upheaval and the board actually supported the actions of the administration. Um, the the uh, then president who did not renew the contracts. And then the chair of the board actually wrote personal letters to the faculty to explain why the non-renewal occurred. And it wasn't a matter of their work but it had to do with um, that they wanted to bring in people with fresh ideas. There was a, there's an there's a urban legend that the cannon that you saw in that first slide was fired at the time. Um, in the, the students fired the cannon um, in revolt, sort of, but it is, we're not sure yet if it's urban legend, but I can't find any documentation yet to prove that story. So at this point, it's still urban legend. So if anybody knows, let me know. Okay, so probably the biggest um, scandal at Cranbrook was a murder that occurred in 1909. This guy named Sam Morley, he was the manager of Cranbrook, which was then mostly farm country. He was shot by a woman named Bertha Leitzow, who was a cook at Cranbrook House. So Bertha felt jilted by Sam. They had been having some sort of relationship over several years, and she apparently was in love with him, and she um, met him on the road one day on Lone Pine Road and confronted him and said, you know, what's going on? I heard you're going to marry someone else, and he said, I absolutely am. It was a local girl named Fanny Padgett, so she took out her revolver and shot him in the neck and the stomach, left him to, for dead in the street, and walked up to Woodward and took the car back down to Detroit where she lived. So neighbors found Sam, who was able to tell them who did it before he died. So they promptly went down to Detroit and arrested Bertha and, uh, for murder. She was put in jail, and actually George Booth was the first one to talk with her after the sheriffs. And Bertha apologized and asked for forgiveness. So Booth hired uh, attorneys for her, as he would have done 
according to his own account, if it had been Sam who had done something similar. Um, this is a letter from um, George's brother to him talking about the trial and, and th they had a discussion about why George made the decision that he made. Um, Ellen Booth actually also testified. She was the last one to testify and her comments were that Bertha had been in ill health and that she had tried to get her to a hospital uh, for treatment. So what ended up happening is Bertha was acquitted on a plea of temporary insanity. This was the first documented murder in Bloomfield and the first woman ever tried in Oakland County for murder, or for anything for that matter. And just one uh, sixth degree of separation before we get to our speaker. There's old Sparty on the left. Sparty was sculpted by uh, Leonard Youngworth, who you can see there in the photograph. Leonard Youngworth was the son of sculptor Joachim Youngworth, who you can see an invoice on the right, sculpted numerous pieces at Cranbrook, including that his, a sample of his woodwork is in the image above. Um, so I just thought that was kind of cool. There was this connection. Um, so now I will introduce our speaker. Hold on one second. Let me see if I can get back to that. Uh-oh. David, it's not showing us. Fuck. Well, anyway, I'll, he'll come down while I'm, I'm talking. So our speaker tonight is Portia Vescio. Portia is the assistant director of the Michigan State University Archives and Historical Collections and oversees the day-to-day -day operations there. She taught a freshman seminar called From Beanies to Body Piercings, The History of MSU Student Life, where she learned many fun stories about uh, Michigan State history. She established and continues to develop the MSU Archives Outreach Program. This includes working with Michigan State faculty to incorporate primary source materials into the curriculum, as well as local community outreach programs. She actually grew up in upstate New York in a community called Rome and went to college at uh, Massachu Massachusetts Institute of Technology. While there, she got a job at the Institute Archives and worked there all four years she was an undergraduate. She decided that she enjoyed uh, working in archives much better than being in a chemistry lab and headed off to library school to pursue, pursue an archival degree. And along with the Rome Historical Society, she authored uh, a publication called Images of America, Rome, published by Arcadia Press. Currently, her goal is to learn more about film and video preservation. The MSU Archives has over 3,000 reels of film. One of her favorites is footage of the Galapagos Islands from the 1930s that she would love to have digitized. Please uh, join us in welcoming Portia Vescio. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, so we're going to just jump right into the scandals. Uh, let me... Okay. Um, I'll start out with the Samuel Johnson affair. I am fascinated with this uh, particular scandal. I don't know if anybody else really is, but because I'm fascinated with it, you guys get to hear all about it. This is one of the earliest scandals in the college history. It started in 1878, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, let me explain a little bit about the early college history so you can understand where this comes from. Back in the early days, MSU was founded as an agricultural college, and that was the only major that there was at MSU. You could just study agriculture. And the farmers of the state were thrilled when the college was started but they very quickly turned against the college because the college wanted to teach scientific agriculture, do experiments, and learn how to do farming methods better or in different ways. And the farmers just wanted to send their sons to school to be better farmers. So it, there was this big uh, push and pull between the college and the farmers. 
And part of that was because it was an agriculture school, they had to do three hours of labor in the fields per day. And that was part of the curriculum. And uh, in this, uh, um, oh, sorry, wrong way. Uh, into this walks Samuel Johnson. Now, Samuel Johnson was educated at Casanova College in New York State, and he served on the state legislature for a few years and was a county, uh, on the county board of school superintendents. So he had both an agriculture and an education background. He was hired by the Board of Agriculture to teach practical agriculture, and that was very uh, important because they just wanted him to run an orderly and efficient farm on the campus. That was his main goal, and he succeeded beyond his boss's wildest dreams. He grew a pedigreed herd of cattle, sold off the extra ones, made a lot of money. He wrote articles. He uh, you know, impressed the farmers of the state. He helped them out with questions. They loved him. Students hated him. For one thing, he replaced the very popular Professor Ingersoll, who had a scientific background. Ingersoll left to become the president of uh, the State Agricultural College of Colorado, and that's the letterhead that you see there. Um, and so they went from being uh, taught science and, and agriculture combined to just being taught how to hoe better. And the students were not thrilled with that. And now, as time progressed, uh, there were other courses eventually introduced. And one of those was engineering. That was the second course introduced into the college. And so the engineers were doing free uh, work in the shops. They were not getting paid for that. Uh, and the, college, the agriculture students who were getting paid for their manual labor in the field were just jealous because they thought that the engineering students were learning something useful where they were being told to go hoe in a field. They couldn't stand it. Uh, there was a story that it said that one honest freshman did as much work as uh, two sophomores, three juniors, or five seniors. What they would do is they would get, try and get a note from their doctor to get them out of uh, their manual labor. If they couldn't do that, they would just go and try and find the farthest spot possible to work and then maybe set a lookout so that if the lookout saw somebody coming, they could run and warn the others and they could pretend that they had been working the entire time. Um, and while the students are you know, very upset with Johnson, they really don't like him at all, the farmers love him. His bosses love him. Uh, he wrote articles for Farmers Review. The farmers wrote in saying how much they loved Johnson, how much they supported him, how terrible it was that the students did, didn't do their work for him. The farmers of the state wrote in and said how much he helped them. He talked at winter institutes. I love those three not very little pigs. Uh, from one of the farmers that rode in to support Johnson. And he was not a stupid man. He knew the students weren't doing their work in the field. So what did he do? He docked their pay. And that was when rebellion began. So they couldn't, uh, they didn't have much uh, that they could do to Johnson, but they took their anger out in the classroom. Uh, they didn't think his lectures were very good, so one of the things they did, I don't know how much you can see, they stacked his furniture. So basically they took all the furniture in his room, shoved it up into the corner, and left it there. Um, another thing they did when the door was locked, they sealed the keyhole with plaster of Paris so that they couldn't get in the next day. Um, uh, they actually took their notebooks and uh, used them to build a bonfire in front of his house. I do not recommend that any students try that these days. Um, one of the things that happened was a student was insubordinate to Johnson and he got expelled. Uh, and uh, one of the, um, uh, okay, another thing that they did, sorry, was uh, you mentioned a skunk. They put hydrogen sulfide in the, uh, stove in his room so that it would smell really bad and 
nobody would confess as to who did it. Finally, Winston said, yeah, I know who did it, but I'm not going to say. And so he was expelled. And so the rest of the uh, senior class walked out with him. Uh, and so they went, this college went back to them and said, look, you guys aren't going to graduate if you don't say who did this. And they said, we're not going to say. And they expelled 18 students of the senior class for that incident. Uh, and then it started to get bad with other faculty as well. So spring 1888, this is, Johnson has worked at the college for a decade now. And then uh, uh, what happened is the school, or the Board of Agriculture gave the college $25,000 to build a new agricultural laboratory. Allegedly, E.J. McEwen, who was a professor of English, was overheard saying, well, what are you going to do with a $25,000 laboratory and a 25 cent professor to put in it? That statement was repeated to one of the uh, members of the Board of Agriculture. And even though McEwen denied having said it, they went ahead and fired him anyway. And that was it for the students. Uh, they refused to take notes in his class. They sat on their notebooks, and they would shuffle their feet on the floor. I don't know if you can hear that, um, so that they couldn't hear what he said anyway. <laughs> and then Johnson made his big mistake. He was fed up with the other faculty because he thought that they were turning students against him. So he accused professors Beale, Kedzie, and Cook and that man there is Johnson. He accused those three of conspiring against him. And just to point out, there's uh, McEwen. Uh, so he could not substantiate the claims that he made that they were uh, conspiring against him or you know, arousing students against him. And so the Board of Agriculture actually followed the same thing that they did with McEwen, and they fired Johnson over that. Um, it took a decade. The students were finally happy. The students formed a Johnsonian committee to try and get rid of him. It was like a big thing at the school at the time. Uh, I say three professors were fired. Uh, what happened, unfortunately, having Johnson uh, be fired was not the end of the story. A few weeks after that, Henry Pattengill, who was uh, an assistant instructor at the college, wrote a column praising uh, E.J. McEwen and uh, um, just saying not nice things about the Board of Agriculture, so they fired him too. Uh, so all in all, because of this whole Johnson, this Johnson affair, uh, the college lost three professors. Uh, a lot of farmers around the state were very, very angry with the college. And then a couple years later, the state but legislature slashed $7,000 from their budget. And that was huge for the time. Uh, and all because uh, people couldn't decide whether they liked Samuel Johnson or not. Well, they liked him or they didn't like him, that there, there was no in between. So, all right. Very scandalous, isn't it? <laughs> all right. All right. So now, now we're moving on to our class strike. OK. Did uh, Cranbrook have the freshman sophomore class rivalry? Okay. All right. So what this was was uh, when the freshmen entered the college, they were the low men on campus. They had to wear a beanie saying that showed that they were freshmen, and uh, they had to uh, show deference to all the upperclassmen, including the sophomores. The sophomores were thrilled that they were no longer freshmen, and so they wanted to torture the freshmen the way they had been tortured the year before, and that ended up in what they called the class rivalry, which in the yearly, early years was just a big fight between the two classes. And what started happening, so this is you know, the late 1800s. Uh, the school is actually growing at this time 
classes are getting bigger, and it's all fun and games, uh, but some of the things that happened were actually quite violent. One year, in 1898, a group of freshmen got out of class, and there were a group of sophomores waiting for them, and threw them all into one of the class fountains. Uh, the freshmen kind of regrouped themselves, formed a flying V, uh, and ran through the sophomore ranks, and actually ended up claiming victory for the day, which allegedly was all in good fun, but parents started hearing about random fights breaking out on campus, and were not very happy that their children were involved in them, and basically the college was getting a reputation for being a very bad and rowdy school. And in 1900, a student was injured as a result of one of these games. So Jonathan Snyder, who was president of the college at that time, said in 1902, you know what, that's it, we can't do this anymore. I'm not going to allow you to have these games anymore. Uh, and so the students were actually quite upset about this. So what did they do? They waited until Jonathan Snyder went out of town in early October, and then they snuck off campus late at night to hold the games. Now, I call them games, but I still mean that it is just basically a big fight between the two large groups of people. Um, in uh, 1902, there were about 1,000 students on campus, so figure each class is about what, uh, 250 people, probably 200 men, you know. Uh, fortunately, what happened was the uh, upperclassmen intervened and said, hey, you know, why don't you pick, you know, some of your largest men, I think they picked about 20 men each to f compete in a big wrestling match. And um, they oversaw uh, the event. But of course, the, uh, Jonathan Snyder found out about it and uh, the students ended up getting in trouble. And then what happened was uh, they took two weeks to investigate, and at the end of October, it ended up that 17 students, nine sophomores, eight freshmen, were expelled from the college for periods ranging from one to three years. Even though 45 students participated in the rush, the other 28 were scheduled for some sort of disciplinary action, but those 17 that had been uh, suspended or expelled had to pack up and leave by the end of the day. That did not sit well with the other students. They thought that it was not fair to give people who did the same thing different levels of punishment. And so what they did is at the lunchtime, they all gathered in the chapel and they decided, I say all, there were probably about 500, so about half the college population gathered, and they decided that what they would do is they would not go to class until the punishment that was eked out was fair to everybody. So day one, no afternoon classes. So the next day, this is October 28th, uh, the next day students were still in revolt. They met first thing in the morning at the chapel again and decided that they were going to hold firm that no, they would not go to classes until uh, the, the situation was resolved with the punishments. Now, the men at this time had a mandatory military drill, and Major Verno, who was in charge of the drill, the students, he was very popular with the students, and he asked them if they would please at least do their military drill, even if they were not going to go to class and they decided that no, they could not show favoritism among the professors, so they would not do their military drill either. Now, some of the professors started to get mad and told the students that if you don't come to class, we're gonna give you zeros and you're gonna end up failing. But students decided, nope, if we don't hang together, we're going to hang separately, we're not going to class. Other thing that happened at this time is on day two, some publicity started to get out about the students not going to class. And the students found that it was not very favorable to them. So they decided that they would draft their own uh, statement. And that says that explains what the purpose of the class rivalry is. Uh, when the freshman class enters college, it is compo composed of many different types. Uh, 
to get uh, this class to work together and to become a unit, some outside force is necessary. This is usually brought about by the sophomores in some manner or other. Numerous harmless practical jokes, and we will get to those harmless practical jokes and you will not think that they are, um, are played on unsuspecting freshmen until he is convinced that the way to even up is by a united effort of his class. So they have a meeting and determine a class scrap. Our demands are not unjust. We do not ask that those participating in the scrap be given no punishment, nor that the faculty surrender its authority, but that it exercise it in a manner that is just to all. Day three, still no classes. They met again in the morning, uh, decided that if the faculty tried to get them to sign something, that no one was signing anything the faculty gave them until it had been reviewed at a uh, big meeting. Meanwhile, parents had read the newspapers the day before, saw that their kids weren't going up, going to class, so they started showing up on parents and said, if you're not gonna go to class, then you're gonna come home. Started yanking kids out of school. So this is October 29th. Halloween is coming up quickly. The weekend is quickly approaching. So the students had to decide what they were gonna do about Halloween. So they came up with a Halloween resolution. If the strike was not finished by Halloween, Halloween was canceled because they did not, it had been very peaceful so far, they did not want to risk anybody causing trouble on Halloween. However, we also had a football game at Olivet that weekend, and they decided that the football game was still on regardless of the strike. So even them, MSU had their priorities. Okay, but at this point, the faculty are starting to get a little fed up with the students, and they're trying to work behind the scenes to get some of the students uh, to, um, you know, come up with some sort of agreement. And it took a while. They, they got some of the younger faculty to uh, approach the students and work with them. And their names were Woodbury, Fowler, and Gardner. Uh, and so they, on behalf of Jonathan Snyder, this is the proposal that they offered to the students on day four. Uh, if the students returned immediately to classes, that the suspended students would be given new hearings and that the final judgment uh, if that was not satisfactory, they could go to the Board of Agriculture and appeal to the board. Now, students, not really thrilled about that, uh, but at this point, they're starting to get nervous because they don't know how they're gonna get out of this strike either, so they decide that they were going to accept uh, that proposal by Jonathan Snyder. And unfortunately for the students, the suspensions did not change at all. The faculty gave out the exact same punishments and the board upheld every single one of them. Now the one thing that did change was the rules for the uh, class rivalry. So that instead of one big brawl, it was broken down into a bunch of smaller organized chaos uh, by Chester Brewer. And so they had different events like a football game, tug of war over the Red Cedar River, or a flag rush. They were all exceedingly violent uh, physical games, but you got points for each one, and whoever won the most number of points at the end, that was the winner. So they did that. Uh, that was the one thing that did change with the way class rivalry was run. Was run. So that was the class strike of 1902. Sorry, I'm used to doing this for like a classroom and I keep wanting to say questions, questions. All right. All right, students, how many of you have heard of the Pinkertons before? So I would expect the adults to, but any students heard of the Pinkertons? A few of you, okay. All right, so this is a, uh, about student life out of control. So back in the early days of the college, the, um, you, the administration tried to crack down on student behavior so you didn't get crazy things happening in the dorms and the classes and stuff. And we'll see how well they did. Uh, one of the rules was about quiet study hours. 
They shall faithfully observe all study hours and remain quietly in their rooms during the same, except on leave of absence. They might be silent, but I don't think they're quiet. Um, they shall neither bring nor use upon the premises any spiritus or intoxicating liquors. Um, and don't forget, this is during the, um, pro or it's not prohibition era, but it's uh, the temperance era was in full swing at this time. And actually, uh, students were quite open about leaving campus to drink. Uh, this, in case you can't read it, it says, yes, professor, there is a light in the window for thee. I'm downtown, but you think I'm here, long as this light you see. Uh, and then on the back, this is a little comic drawn by a student. It says, members of the faculty sometimes watched students' windows to determine if the student was industrious and at home. There was a rule against students going downtown without permission, especially at night. The lamp in the window all night led one professor to declare that he knew Mr. X was studying hard because he often noticed a light in Mr. X's window as late as two o'clock in the morning. It was notorious that Mr. X was downtown practically every night. In fact, they knew the students were doing this and Jonathan Snyder went to the saloon keepers and begged them not to sell alcohol to their, his students but they were his, their best customers. So of course, the saloon keeper said no. Okay. Uh, the use of tobacco and other narcotics being disapproved of under all circumstances is forbidden in any of the college buildings. You can see how well those guys listened. No student will be permitted to use obscene or profane language. And I don't know if you can read that, but that is, uh, the uh, text on the top is an artwork of uh, the English language, I have to say, and I'm not even sure that I can read it. You blithering, boneheaded, beetle-brained, bubbling babes, you unkempt, ugly, unsophisticated, ubiquitous, uncouth, unclean ulcers. And then I can't see the rest of it, but they did a great job of insulting. This is one of the class rivalry posters. The sophomores created that, and that's toward the freshmen. Card playing and other games of chance are wholly prohibited. You can see how well they did that one, and one of my favorites, upright and gentlemanly deportment will on all occasions be required. Uh, if any of you have MSU connections, I'm sure that doesn't shock you at all. Um, and yes, that's a little bit of a cheat because that's from the 1960s, but this one is not. These are my naked, drunk, smoking, gambling guys from 1906. And in fact, not only do we have this picture, we have their names on the back so we know who these guys are. Uh, and just to note to uh, students, a uh, hundred years later, these pictures are completely awesome, but if you take a picture like this now and put it on your Facebook page, you're not going to get a job. Just remember that. Um, so yes, student life was out of control, and uh, Jonathan Snyder had no idea what to do, so he thought about it and his solution he was going to hire a Pinkerton detective to go undercover as a student and root out the bad ones. So the Pinkerton agent's name was Mr. J.E. Spencer, and he enrolled as a special forestry student on May 22, 1909. Uh, when uh, Spencer arrived on campus, he went to see Snyder, which was not unusual at that time, and Snyder told him there were two incidents he wanted him to look into in addition to the drinking. Uh, one was looking at someone had cut down a special tree on campus and he wanted him to see if he could find out who had done that. And someone had broke into the armory and stole 10,000 pounds of cartridges that were used in the military drill. I just think that is an engineering marvel that you could steal 10,000 pounds of cartridges and have no one notice that. <laughs> okay, so this, uh, Spencer was put into uh, Wells Hall. This was affectionately known by the students as Hell's Wall. Um, he had a roommate 
So he did what any new student on campus would do. He kind of hung around the dorm, got to know people. He went to his classes so he could, you know, lend credibility to the fact that he was a student. But it didn't take long for students to open up to him, and within a week, they were showing him the ways that they managed to sneak alcohol back onto campus and were inviting him to the poker games that they played in the dorms. Um, didn't take long. One of the incidents that uh, Spencer learned about was this is College Hall. This was the first building on the MSU campus. Uh, some of the students had gotten pistols and maybe some of the stolen armory, uh, so stolen cartridges, and had shot out all of the light bulbs in College Hall. Uh, the student who told the story, uh, Spencer was trying to find out if he knew the name who did it, and the guy would not tell him, but he said, well, let me in on it next time, because I can hit one of the damn things every pop. Apparently, they had missed one light bulb. Uh, another thing that they tried to do was um, while they were out in Lansing drinking in the saloons, they decided one night they would steal a barrel of oil and grease the streetcar rails so that people couldn't get through the streetcars. But I think they got a little too drunk because that one did not get successfully pulled off. And there was quite an argument over who was uh, at fault for not uh, pulling that one off. Uh, other things that they were doing, um, they would steal fruit and other food from boarding clubs on campus. Uh, they would associate with women of questionable character. Uh, and in fact, it was so bad that Spencer had a per diem of $10 per day, and he wrote to his boss and said, I need more money. I cannot keep up with these students on this per diem. That was quite a lot back then. So it took him about a month. Uh, but on June 16th, 1909, uh, that was when he put in his final report, and uh, that's when the faculty decided that they were going to take action. And as a result, 11 students, and that does include Spencer, were expelled from school. So what happened is they were called in individually to Jonathan Snyder's office first thing in the morning, and uh, they were told uh, what what the faculty knew about them. And some of the students were like, well, you know, they seem to know a lot, but they couldn't really prove anything. Uh, some of them uh, were upset uh, about that and thought that they might try and fight it. Some of the people were kind of surprised that they lasted as long as they had, and others decided, oh, well, you know what, I'm just gonna go to town and ha get a few more drinks before I have to go back home. Uh, and it ended up costing the school almost $300 for that investigation, but that rooted out the worst of the people uh, that uh, they had found. So, okay. That was the Pinkerton investigation. Seriously, I just feel like going, questions, questions? Yeah, if you have at questions afterward, don't be shy. I'm used to students uh, just shouting things out. But I know you want to hear all about the hazing and pranks. So uh, just a word of advice, you know, these might have been all good and fun back in the day, but some of these things, if you were to do them today, you would be arrested. Um, one of the things that the students did uh, early on was uh, they wrote publications that were kind of funny. The bubble it was very mild. This was actually the first student campus publication that we know about. It came out in 1868 and lasted for seven issues. And uh, it was very mild humor. They had columns called Bugs and Humbugs by our bugologist. And the editor's name was Frank S. Burton, but he went by Hezekiah Z. Solemn style. Very mild. This one, uh, the coal hod is actually a, um, it's a play on words because the whole cad was the name of the student yearbook and that's where this appeared. And then they just did kind of, again, light humor, nothing too offensive, making fun of the faculty, um, making fun of things going on on campus. This is late 1800s, early 1900s. By the 1920s, the early 1920s, you get the green onion, very mild humor, poems, short stories. Again, nothing too offensive, cartoons, short jokes, and then you get to the eczema. The eczema came out in the mid-1920s, and it was a uh, 
newspaper, we think it came out in the mid-1920s. The journalism uh, initiates uh, wrote the eczema, but they did a terrible job of actually dating it. And there's like four different volume ones because they just felt like calling it whatever they wanted to call it. Uh, the purpose of the eczema was to offend, and it did. Its stories were borderline libelous. In fact, there was one issue that came out in 1928 that the postmaster refused to deliver because he said it would burn holes in his mail sack. Uh, some of the headlines of this one are three students hang for being intellectual, orgy of forbidden intelligence found by campus sneak. And eventually what happened is this was just so bad that the administration told them, you can't do this anymore, we are shutting this one down. The dorms were ripe for pranks. Um, the students were actually supposed to govern themselves in the dormitory, and this did not work at all. Uh, they would throw the ash pail down the stairs. They would imprison students in their room by jamming their door shut. They would dump water out of the window onto passersby walking below. They would smash the electric lights, any doors, windows, anything. In fact, it was so bad that in 1895, when the college was going through a bad period and they created this faculty committee to uh, make suggestions on how to improve the college, one of their suggestions was to get rid of the dormitories completely. But uh, Jonathan Snyder decided that he was not going to do that because the dormitories made it possible for students of all uh, levels of wealth to go to school, and so, it was because of that that the dormitories at MSU were saved. Remember we mentioned how they stacked uh, um, the room of uh, Samuel Johnson? If you were a freshman, it was not a matter of, what, uh, of if your room was gonna get stacked, it was when your room got stacked and this is what your dorm room would look like. So basically what would happen is you would be woken up in the wee hours of the morning forced to run around campus, maybe blindfolded, maybe not, maybe with your hands tied, maybe not. But when you got back to your room exhausted after a few hours, this is what you would find. Uh, um, the J-Hop. Remember the freshman and the sophomore class rivalry? Well, they didn't stop hating each other just because they moved up to the next year. Uh, the J-Hop or Junior Hop was the social event of the season. In fact, it was like the social event of campus. It was the one event on campus where people got to stay out until two o'clock in the morning. Everyone got dressed up. It was very fancy, very expensive to go. And the sophomores still hated the juniors who had tormented them the year before or a couple years before. So they would do whatever they could to disrupt the J-hop. Things like introducing greased pigs onto the dance floor or uh, shooting out all the lights so that they couldn't hold the festivities. Um, one of the other things they did, in this one they did the hydrogen sulfide again, but this one their apparatus had so much, um, uh, had so much gas in it that it, if it had gone off, it could have killed everyone who was in the armory. And actually, people did get suspended as a result of that. Uh, the, the sophomores, actually, the J-Hop was held in February. Sometimes it was held on campus, but it was also held in Lansing. Uh, they actually did manage to successfully uh, grease the street rails one year and left the juniors sitting out in February at 2 o'clock in the morning with no way to get back to campus. So and that was one of the things that they did. Hazing was very, very bad at this time. Freshmen, you had to wear your beanies. If you weren't wearing your beanies, you would get beaten up by older students. If you wore your high school insignia on campus grounds, you were thrown in the Red Cedar River. You were a college freshman, and you were expected to wear your college insignia. Um, hazing was so bad, one incident was, uh, a freshman was grabbed by several students, had broken eggs rubbed into his scalp, then they cut off his hair, tied a sack over his head, and were holding him down in the river until he managed to escape. Uh, sometimes you were grabbed out of your bed, blindfolded, had soap stuck in your mouth, and then forced to run around campus. Uh, it was so bad that the college actually banned hazing in 1908. 
it's pretty early to ban hazing. And this lovely cartoon is actually from the uh, eczema again. And it's making fun of the hazing, saying that freshmen need, or that the sophomores were going around teasing freshmen who had to be armed. Then we're gonna start getting a little bit milder. Um, there are some other things uh, that they did. These are sort of mild ways to end the um, pranks section. The Swartz Creek Band was actually a real band, uh, but they decided that they would have a little bit more fun than the uh, military band, who is the only other band at this time. These guys, I don't know how much you can tell, but they're in goofy hats and some goofy clothes. And they were real musicians, and they actually rivaled the band in terms of uh, in terms of quality and they would play at the different games. It was uh, organized by a cheerleader and Swartz Creek comes uh, allegedly from a mythical college that the uh, campus barber said he went to. Um, and then finally one of the things that they did was uh, they created Bolshevik Days in uh, 1919. Uh, so at that time seniors weren't content with uh, having uh, holidays in the first, second, and last weeks in May. So in the third and fourth weeks, they created their own holidays. And basically, any ho excuse for a holiday, they just called Bolshevik days. And uh, so they would meet, they would have parades, they would have dances, and it was just uh, an excuse to not go to class at the end of the semester. Um, and they called it Bolshevik Days because it occurred near the end of the Russian Revolt. And uh, the editor of the 1919 yearbook called that year the year of jazz and Bolshevism because of all the parties they threw uh, during that time. Okay. And so our last little story uh, talks about a prankster who uh, eventually made his way back to MSU. All right, look at that sweet little child. That is Forrest Hammond Akers, who was born on a farm near Williamston, Michigan on December 31st, 1886. Uh, he went to Williamston High School and he was actually class president there. And after graduation, Akers made his way to Michigan Agricultural College. He arrived in 1905 and he was a forestry major and his friends called him one of the oddest students on campus. And they said right from the start, study held a peculiar fascination for him. He could sit for hours and watch other students working at it. And for some reason, I, and I don't know why it's not explained, but his friends, uh, his nickname was Polly. And like all other freshmen at the time, Akers was subject to hazing and so one night, he was uh, walking alone in downtown Lansing, probably where he shouldn't have been, and he encountered a group of sophomores. And as he told his friends, he could have pretended to have been a stranger and asked where the local, uh, you know, asked where a local hotel was. He, he could have uh, just kind of hid out and waited until they left, or uh, he could have uh, done what he did, which was run for it. And his friends read a poem about his escapade, and they said, listen, my children, and you shall hear of a man who outdistanced Paul Revere. Of a man, um, early in fall of 95, many a man is now alive who remembers a group of sophomores jolly chasing the hell out of freshman Polly. So he made it back to his boarding hall. That was safe spot. And he said after several minutes, when he got his breath back, so it's actually several miles from downtown Lansing to the MSU campus. Uh, he said he would have almost rather had taken the hazing than to have done that run. Uh, not only was uh, Akers a student, but he was the, uh, on the um, star pitcher for the baseball team, center role, top uh, middle guy, the tall one. Um, he was also a known prankster. He was actually expelled one term for excessive pranking. And then in 1907, uh, President Teddy Roosevelt came to MSU as the commencement speaker to celebrate our uh, semi-centennial celebration. 
During his speech, a powder keg exploded that shattered all the windows in the nearby dormitories and the greenhouses. Now, Akers was blamed for that, but he never, he uh, adamantly denied having anything to do with that powder keg explosion. However, he was suspended a term. Uh, he came back for a semester, but uh, it, was, it was too late for him. Uh, in 1908, uh, he was expelled for good. And this is a letter from uh, President Snyder to Aker's father. And it says, uh, I herewith enclose the report of your son's work for the term, which is just closed. Our doubtful case committee has gone over his record very carefully and have instructed me to request to you to withdraw him from college uh, for the present. The quality of his work has been so poor during the past term that they feel it would be impossible for him to do acceptable work during the coming term. So he lasted not quite three years, if you count the time that he was expelled, and was eventually kicked out of MSU to make it on his own. And he did. Uh, he spent six years selling farm implements, working first for the Oliver Chilled Plow Works and then for the Ohio Rake Company. And then he was uh, hired as a salesman for the Rio Motor Car Company in Lansing. Uh, and he was, uh, at Rio, he kind of hit home. He was promoted to regional sales manager. And he claimed that he was the one who came up with the term REO Speedwagon. Um, he ended up leaving REO, Rio and ended up working for Dodge. Uh, he spent, uh, he was a sales manager promoted to the Detroit region uh, and became eventually vice president of Chrysler Corporation's Dodge division. And he remained at Dodge until he retired in 1947 and actually made a very successful career of himself. And after he retired from Dodge, he decided, you know what I want to do? I want to give back to MSU. Even though they kicked him out, he held no resentment about the college and would always say, you know what, I deserved what I got from the college back in those days. So in 1957, uh, he was elected to the Board of Trustees and uh, he served on the board for 18 years. And not only did he serve on the Board of Trustees and help uh, run the college, but he gave back financially to the college. Uh, he um, gave his retirement gift from Dodge, which was $45,000, gave that to the college to start the Forest Acres Scholarship. He donated one of his, a house that he had received in Florida. Uh, so I don't know, they probably sold that money, that property, I don't know what they did with that. Um, he was the one, the Forest Acres Golf Course, he donated the money and the land for that. And he also donated additional money and the uh, Acres uh, Dormitory is named after Forrest and his wife. Um, he also, uh, they rewarded him by giving him an honorary law degree. And he also went back to all of his reunions, even though he never officially graduated from the college. Uh, the class that he entered with in 1905 still considered him one of their own. And uh, he would always go back to the reunions and hang out with the friends that he made in college. And so uh, even though he was uh, quite the prankster, uh, he uh, ended up having a really good career with MSU. And uh, so, you know, bad stories can have good endings. And on that note, I'm gonna end this presentation. So thank you very much for coming out tonight. Did anyone have any questions or no? Or if not, if you come down, I have Funkadelic Mood Pencils if you want to grab any of those. <laughs> What's a Funkadelic Mood Pencil? <laughs> <laughs> I've never had any of those happen with, with her.